Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Schrader. I am the Senior Vice President of Clinical Care here at Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. Um, we are so happy to have you join us today as we continue our series of webinars surrounding Duchenne and the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you've listened to our previous installments, we've tackled a lot of different issues um, as far as Duchenne and how it pertains to our current pandemic situation. You know that we're all um, really just trying to navigate this new, what is hopefully a temporary new normal. Um, and one of those issues that has uh, been a very quick learning curve for a lot of us is the concept of telehealth appointments. So, um, if you haven't already had to experience a telehealth appointment, you probably have one uh, coming up soon. And so hopefully we can go over um, telehealth appointments, what to expect, and how to make the most of them today. If you took the COVID-19 survey that we circulated for parents and caregivers, one of those questions was about telehealth and if it was available at your neuromuscular center where you uh, get the bulk of your neuromuscular care. And we got some interesting data. So about a third of respondents said, yes, telehealth is available to me through my neuromuscular center. A very small portion said no, but a lot of people weren't sure whether or not telehealth capabilities were available to them to receive neuromuscular care from a safe distance. And we thought, you know, that was really interesting to us. And it just speaks to the fact that things are changing really quickly and we want to be a resource to our community so that you know what's available and how to access it. Um, also interesting was the distribution of folks who have had telehealth visits so far and those who haven't. So as you can see by this slide here, a vast majority of folks have not yet had telehealth visits. And because we realize that these are probably going to be here to stay at least for the foreseeable future, hopefully we can give you some practical tips and tricks so that you know what to expect as these telehealth visits continue down the pipeline. So we've got some great speakers with us today. We have Dr. Mena Spadina, who's a neurologist and the director of the Certified Duchenne Care Center at Nemours um, Hospital for Children in Wilmington, Delaware. We've also got Dr. Oren Cooper, who's a pulmonologist at Children's Hospital of Colorado, Dr. Linda Pike, who is a cardiologist at Nationwide Children's, and Alexis Hazlitt, who is the clinic coordinator and a nurse at Kansas Mercy um, can't, Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Goodness gracious, how's this recording today? So to start, we're going to hear from Dr. Spadina, who's going to talk a little bit about that neuromuscular perspective and her experience and lessons learned. So Dr. Spadina, I'll turn it over to you. Dr. Spadina, are you there? Help me. Can you hear me? Hello. I can hear you can clear. You now. Yes, okay. perfect. Thank you. Oof. We were having some sound issues before, so um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and thank you for um, doing this conference today. So uh, interesting percentages uh, that you just showed, um, Rachel. And, you know, I think there are a few factors with that. When this all started, March, middle of March, Things happen very abruptly, and I, and I will speak from my perspective, but I, I believe that's what many of us encountered, that suddenly we were asked to um, cancel patients until there was a telehealth system that could um, support everyone. And um, so the reason you may not have had a telehealth appointment yet is because many of those early visits were, were canceled or moved forward until systems were placed um, uh, to be able to accommodate enough people. And I see now in my own office and clinic that people are starting to be rescheduled, and we're being told on a daily basis different things, actually, um, in terms of how far to extend the televisit um, appointment. So you may very well be called or have a telehealth scheduled as opposed to an inpatient uh, or in-house visit um, in the next few months. Um, so I just thought I'd talk about a few things that I've encountered, and really this has uh, been my experience as I've tried to um, go through these hoops that we've been presented with. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, a few things that have come up as I've learned how to do these tele 
health visits. Um, clearly, our exam is, is less detailed than one that would be done in person in the office. I mean, I think that's obvious to everyone. Certain aspects um, from a neurologic standpoint, such as testing muscle strength, doing reflexes, uh, checking contractures, it's, it's really something that's difficult to do uh, in this manner. However, we'll talk a little bit about how those things could be done um, and how we try to get around this. Um, some people may not feel comfortable discussing issues or complaints by video, particularly since this is kind of a whole new world for many of us, both for the providers and for the um, patients as well. Um, difficult um, situations such as this is your last visit and suddenly you're doing it by televisit uh, or telehealth. Um, it, I think that can be that can be difficult. And um, rather than seeing a team of people as you may be doing at your clinic visits, you may not be seeing everyone but just one person by telehealth. So those are some limitations that I've encountered. Next slide, please. Advantages. Well, if you're afraid of perhaps contracting COVID by being in a public space or going to a hospital or a clinic, this is one way to avoid it. So that, that is the, the main reason for doing these uh, visits and uh, both for, for you, for the other providers, for family members. And so we have to keep remembering that we're doing this to stay safe and stay healthy. Um, advantages, I think it does give you an opportunity to discuss any medication issues you may have, concerns you're having, and um, bring up some of those questions that perhaps you've been thinking about. Clinical trials, will this continue? What about the trial I'm in? Um, so having a face-to-face -to, -face to bring these questions uh, up front um, is helpful. Some decisions that perhaps were on the back burner that you are going to discuss at your next clinic visit, such as whether you wanted to start steroids or, or hold on steroids, could be brought up. Um, recently, I had a visit in which um, a family discussed their need or want to begin exon skipping therapy and how that would look in this uh, world of COVID restrictions. Uh, so we were able to discuss that in, in person, if you will. And then I think for us as the providers, it, it allows us to see how you're doing. It, we are able to assess, assess overall function, see in general if you've been healthy or if there are things going on. Uh, for some of the younger boys, we can look at um, gait, seating, or technology needs can be brought up. And I, I just spoke today to one of our um, uh, orthotists. You know, they are seeing children um, for their orthotics. So if that's something that needs to be done, we can then refer you. And generally, how's, how's your mood and how are you doing dealing with all this? Next slide, please. So some suggestions I have, and clearly this is um, a work in progress, that may make a, a visit a bit smoother. Um, I am the first to say that be familiar with the technology you need to connect for the visit. I myself had a televisit as a patient yesterday, and if my daughter wasn't here to switch to Chrome, my current computer would not have supported the technology that I needed for that visit. So make sure that you can connect. This morning I was assisting my own, my father who's um, older with his orthopedist and they had to switch to a phone visit because the Wi-Fi at the time was too slow and the physician said, just switch me to a phone visit. So um, there is technology that I think we're all trying to perfect but get on um, your computer or your phone with enough time to make sure you can sign in um, and to check and see if, if this if you're if you need to download anything or if you're having difficulties. Um, I think across the board, all of my partners, um, my husband who is doing telemed, we have all had to switch from a video encounter. The video suddenly goes out. Uh, there's an issue, and then we switch to a phone visit. So that is something that we see happening, and um, I think you need to sort of stick with it. Um, you can use your phone and still continue the, the visit or concerns you're having um, if the video is lost. Um, and, and again, the other providers may have suggestions or um, their own experience. We are all using different um, 
forms of technology. In my office, we're using something called American Wellness. Other doctors are using Doximity. So there are different programs people are using. Um, and I don't want to focus on that too much except to say that um, you have to be a little bit flexible, have a phone available, know that you may need to switch from video to phone um, uh, if the connection is lost. Something that was suggested to me um, by the orthopedist that I actually I had to see for a shoulder issue, and I thought this was um, helpful and something that we could all use, is that um, it would be best to pretend you're going to that visit. And if you came to our office, um, some of the younger children, we would give them shorts to wear. We'd ask um, to take off any sweaters or loose and, and have loose clothing on so that we could assess their muscle bulk, their function, look for any contractures, watch their gait, and um, uh, see particularly if there's any type of swelling in the extremities. So it's helpful if you can prepare um, as though you're going to a visit and not have a lot of sweaters or um, blankets or clothing that will make it difficult for the physician to to actually see you. And position yourself in a place where the provider can see as much of your child or young adult as possible so that there's space around you. Um, if there are issues with the, the chair particularly, that's something that the, the provider could then see. And um, for some of the younger children, have a space, a hallway or an open space in the room um, when they ask if you can run or walk or stand from a seated position. So having the space to move about will make it also um, more um, accessible for you and for the provider looking on. Okay, next slide, please. So just in summary, this is a learning curve for all of us, believe me. Um, and some people like it and some people don't. Um, I think when we're trying to stay as far away from each other and, and um, follow social distancing uh, requirements. We have this and I'm grateful for it. It's not perfect and none of us really, I think, feel that this is uh, something that we would prefer. However, until things open up, this may be a means in which we'll be able to connect and so we are trying to improve and perfect it as much as we can. Um, it's not ideal, um, but again, I think if there are issues, this is something you can call your physician, you can ask to have a telehealth if you haven't had one already. Um, some places may just not be converting to telehealth yet, um, but it's something you can call your physician's office and ask if that is a mode that uh, you can have a visit, even if it's to discuss medications or concerns you're having. Some examples of where I thought it was helpful um, we recently had a young man who, it was his last clinic visit with us, and I've known him since he's five, and he's now turning 21. So this was a time to wrap up, to make sure that he is set for his transition to the adult provider, any last um, labs or tests that we wanted to do. I said, okay, since we can't do these right now, this is something we're going to need to do when you start seeing your adult provider. So it allowed for some closure. Uh, rather than not seeing him, and then it would be time to transition, at least in our facility uh, at 21. Um, we had another family that said, okay, you know what, we've decided we want to start um, Expondus, and, uh, and how do we go about doing that? How's that going to work um, if we end up going to home care? So it allowed some discussion face-to-face -face about these um, really important issues that have not been put on hold, um, through all of this. So um, I just encourage all of you to reach out to your providers. Um, if you have not had a visit, if you'd like to have a visit, you may be hearing from them as they are scheduling these moving forward. I know that we've just been asked to um, schedule everyone through the end of May at least for a telehealth visit if possible. But anyone that is having any urgent issues, then um, we could arrange for them to be seen in person. And that's, I think, different for every department, every hospital, so I would um, talk to your clinic with those questions specifically. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Scavina. Those were some really great insights and really practical advice for families as they gear up for these telehealth visits here in the future. So thank you so much for that perspective. 
Um, I, I think that there are definitely some differences in the neuromuscular exam and what that interaction looks like via telehealth versus the pulmonary and cardiac perspectives that require um, equipment and more testing and some of this um, baseline evaluation that you really aren't able to do in the same way through these um, telehealth visits. So at this point, we're going to hear from Dr. Oren Kupra, who is a pulmonologist, and he's going to talk a little bit about lessons learned pre and in the midst of a pandemic with telehealth, as well as um, his experiences from that pulmonary side of things. Hi, everyone. Um, new development here in Colorado. Our institution, our institution's internet just went down. So I'm going to use the slides that I have, which I think are the same as that everyone else has, but I'm not going to be able to advance them. So we're going to uh, pretend that everything is fine and do this together. So um, No worries. Just let us know and we'll advance them for you. So let's go to the outline slide. So I... Um, so I'm going to talk about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and then do's and don'ts. A lot of this is what Dr. Scabina has already talked about, but I'm going to put a little bit of a pulmonary twist on it. Uh, let's go to the strengths slide. So uh, as Dr. Scabina said very well, there are strengths in telehealth. One, you don't have to travel. You're already at your appointment in your living room. Uh, you are not going to get an infection in your living room that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten. Uh, and there's really nothing to forget to bring, which uh, when you're talking about having a lot of respiratory equipment or any respiratory equipment uh, can be something that's easily forgotten when you come to, when you travel to clinic. So now everything's right there with you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. There are some limitations, of course, um, in terms of the pulmonary exam. We don't have vital signs unless you already have a pulse oximeter or you take your blood pressure at home. Uh, but not everyone has that. I certainly can't listen to chests, uh, but and I can't do pulmonary function tests, but there are things that we can do. Uh, and because muscular dystrophy is obviously a disorder of the muscles, I can still look at the chest and see how it works, how it functions. So just like Dr. Scavina mentioned, having loose clothing, clothing that's easy to take off, having space to move about in can be helpful. For the, for the chest exam, I like to examine my patients in at least two positions, either standing or sitting upright and then laying down. So uh, if, you're, if you have a power chair, uh, I often examine my patients laying down in the power chair. Uh, so that might be easier than um, a manual chair if you have that at home. Um, or we can be you know, sitting on the couch uh, and then laying down on the couch. Um, so there's a lot that we can still do um, of course, uh, I'm witness to it right now. Technical difficulties are always uh, potential. Uh, it's best if you have a good camera and a good connection, but we aren't always so fortunate. Let's go to opportunities. So this is a little bit of a bigger picture. I think we are in a place where we're going to be able to leverage telehealth for the future. We're we are going to be able to see patients in a mixed model where sometimes we use telehealth, sometimes we use in-person visits, and we have to, as a neuromuscular team, decide when each mode is the best one for what we're trying to achieve. Uh, as, as I said, there are good strengths for telehealth, no need for travel, no risk of infection, can't forget anything. And so maybe we should use that in some cases, um, you know, in regions of the country where um, you have to travel a long distance. In my area, we cover seven states, and they're not small ones. Um, we also have uh, bad weather sometimes, and interstate highways are closed, um, and maybe we can change that to a telehealth visit. Um, sometimes we have acute weather changes, and you're already scheduled for a visit. Well, you shouldn't miss that visit. Maybe that day we flip over to a telehealth visit instead of just saying, eh, we'll try to reschedule you. So we can really make telehealth work for us. Um, I think one of the big benefits to telehealth is that we can evaluate patients in what I call a non-artificial setting, meaning in the home. We can actually see what your function means to you, what it's like in your home. And it might seem a little invasive where the doctor's asking, hey, show me, show me the bathroom door. Now, 
pulmonologist isn't going to ask you that, but a, a rehab doctor or neurologist may ask you, or, or a physical therapist may ask you, uh, just to see what it's like to function in your home. Uh, and then uh, there, there are opportunities. A number of places are working on um, medical equipment, equipment for the home in terms of stethoscopes and potentially even doing pulmonary function tests in the home. Um, so that's, that's up and coming, and that could be a really exciting development. It could really revolutionize the way we take care of, of young men with Duchenne. Let's go to the next slide. So these helpful hints um, are a little bit of what Dr. Scabino talked about. Um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. The one thing uh, that I will suggest is that you turn off all your other apps, videos, streaming, et cetera, on your phone. Uh, and, and actually on every other device in the house to maximize your signal so that the video and the audio come through as well as possible. Um, certainly try to use your Wi-Fi and not a data plan um, because that can get really expensive really fast. And then I've actually had the experience of people calling into their telehealth appointment from the car. Uh, that's not safe. Uh, so. I would suggest not doing visits on the go. I've done some visits in the parking lot uh, where patients are going from one appointment to another or running errands and it's time for their appointment, so they pull over and we do the visit in the minivan. Again, not the best, but um, when life is as chaotic as it is right now, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. And we actually had a very good visit and it was really nice to see my patient getting some sunlight. Uh, they actually got more sunlight that day than I did, and I thought it was um, really kind of fun to do. And again, seeing my patient in a, in a non-artificial environment was really informative. So that's what I have to say. Uh, I guess the, the one other, sorry, the one other topic is um, access to sleep studies. Uh, depending on your institution, sleep labs may have been shut down or may still be shut down, um, and that, that's going to cause a backlog. Um, we're going to have to contend with that. Some providers uh, are more or less comfortable with empirically starting non-invasive ventilation, um, and some of us are more or less comfortable with even titration of non-invasive ventilation or cough assist by telemedicine. Um, so that's something that we're still trying to figure out. Um, and so just be flexible with your providers, and if they don't offer some of these things, then ask about uh, when they could offer those things. All right, now I'm really done. <laughs> Thank you so much. And these are great helpful hints to add to our arsenal of helpful hints from do's and don'ts. I appreciate the don't hide your kids or pets. We like them too. I think that um, we're learning how to engage with these telehealth visits when we still have real life happening all around us in our homes or in our minivans or um, in our backyards. So I, I think that that's a novel point to make that um, as we all learn and as we all adjust to this new normal, that life is continuing to happen and things are not perfect. Um, so if you've got kids or pets in the background, it's probably not going to be the end of the world. I know that my uh, own colleagues have heard my dog bark in the background at least more than once. So um, worth mentioning. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Next up, we've got Dr. Linda Kripp, who is a cardiologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, as you all know, Duchenne affects the heart, too. And so we've got echoes and ECGs and cardiac MRIs and pulse monitors. Oh, my. Um, so we're going to hear from her about her experience with telehealth and how she has adjusted to um, doing these types of visits without having a lot of that critical information that's so necessary to make recommendations. Dr. Kripp? All right. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, telemedicine has arrived, and it really arrived quickly and really truly overnight in some states um, uh, and in clinical settings. Uh, there was a – in Ohio, we were moving towards doing telehealth, but there were a number of obstacles, not only from insurance providers, but from the state legislature, and um, literally as soon as the state home order was – um, issued the uh, laws changed. So in some regards, it's sort of the wild, wild west. And I think that you have already heard from um, uh, the two previous presenters that there are differences in some regards with regard with 
with how telemedicine is being practiced in each individual medical center. And I think that reflects the fact that we're all just learning at this moment in time. So patients and families and providers are on a very, very steep learning curve. And we need to be patient as we understand how to use this tool to provide outstanding care. And I think like Oren just said, we're, well, we're going to come to that. But um, I think that we're all still trying to figure out what types of visits are best used in a telemedicine environment and how can we provide optimal care. This um, uh, is maybe what your visit looks like. You know, there'll be two types of parts to this visit. One will be scheduling and the other one will be on the day of the visit. Um, the, on, with regards to scheduling the visits, the visits can be by um, video or phone, and the nursing staff will review the patient list and determine who needs to be seen, who can be delayed. Um, and you can also participate in that by calling in to your um, medical center and saying, you know, we really have an issue that has been pressing. We've been kind of ignoring it because of this COVID issue. We now appreciate that there's telemedicine that might be available, and we'd really like to address it with the provider. Can we be put on the schedule for a telemedicine visit? Um, I think that would be tremendously helpful. I, I think to appreciate the fact that these are scary times. Uh, I think families and um, have not wanted to come into medical centers. We've definitely demonstrated that through our um, census, um, that uh, no one wants to have unnecessary exposures, but um, health care needs to continue. So um, the administrators or the nurses will call them to call the patients and schedule for a video or a billable phone visit. Uh, if it will be a video visit. We will, um, at our institution, you'll need a computer with Zoom capabilities, and you may need an account with MyChart or other similar platforms provided by your hospital. Each hospital is going to be different with regards to the software they're using, and so I would call in advance, maybe even the day before or two days before, connect with the administrator or the scheduler to make sure that you have the equipment and that your equipment is up and running, just like the other two presenters mentioned. On the day of the visit, prior um, to the visit, the clinic staff can check the patient into the room and onto my chart and Zoom at our institution. Um, the nursing staff will log in and complete their portion of the visit. Then each provider who is going to be seeing that patient will come into the um, system in a coordinated way. The visit is then completed and the chart is closed and then the bill is submitted. So, you know, it sounds extremely easy and it can be, but um, my experience with this is that it can be very glitchy and the glitches come from the computer system um, uh, going down, the family struggling with um, getting connected into the appropriate system, people logging in, people logging off. So, I mean, I think there can be a lot of challenges there. Um, so be prepared at least for the initial visits that you have that um, you may have to um, have a little bit of patience. You know, like the other two providers mentioned, um, I think there's tremendous advantages. Um, you can access providers without exposure to a potentially high-risk environment. Um, as mentioned, it does eliminate travel time, especially uh, for families with physical disabilities. Uh, it allows you access to providers throughout the U.S. And I think that this is maybe um, a really important point, is that all of a sudden it is possible that you can um, easily see somebody who would not normally be available to you because of insurance reasons in other situations. And so, but this may take a little bit of homework on your part to call your insurance provider and see what their telemedicine requirements and restrictions are. It is possible, let's say, for example, that you wanted to specifically talk to a provider that you had met to a, met at a meeting who was really connecting with you on a certain aspect of your child's care who practiced at a hospital, out, you know, hundreds of miles away from you, all of a sudden that provider may be accessible to you and your child. Um, it also, in some regards, allows for a more efficient clinic, clinic visit um, in that, you know, you're sitting in your house, the providers come to you um, via your computer, you can um, – uh, multitask between times when that individual pops into your computer screen. Um, uh, 
but, um, it, you know, it, it's going to depend on the situation. Some disadvantages are that Zoom and Internet access can be challenging. Um, definitely a physical exam isn't possible other than sort of a general look at the patient and um, to look for rashes. Um, like Oren mentioned, there's a number of devices that are being currently developed and, and are currently available to do in-home testing in certain disciplines. Um, patients will still need to travel um, outside for labs um, and imaging. And this is really important for me as a cardiologist. I think cardiology is going to struggle with a lot of telemedicine visits because we really depend upon imaging and looking at the cardiac function. We also uh, depend on looking at an EKG. Now, there's a number of EKG monitoring systems that can be done um, through uh, devices that you can have at your home that you can transmit that information to us electronically. So I think um, we will continue to need to explore that over time. Um, you can also get some um, rhythm tracings on your uh, on your phone. You can put your phone up to the to the computer screen and show me what the tracings are. Um, so we're going to be we're going to be working through this and exploring through this. And and I guarantee you that five years from now, this is going to be an amazing technology, and it and I think it's going to be transformative for how healthcare is practiced. But we are definitely um, uh, in our infancy at the moment. Um, so, from a cardiology standpoint, you still may need to, you still will need to come into the hospital to obtain prior to the uh, testing for cardiac MRIs, um, echocardiograms. You know, it's possible that, especially for kids with um, muscular dystrophies, that you can have the majority of your, your visit through a telemedicine visit and then. For the cardiology visit, we can schedule that at a different time, um, maybe the time when you're coming to the hospital for a test for other reasons. Um, so you're going to have to work with your provider. I, I would also encourage you to have an open dialogue with your clinic staff at the moment. And I, and I think maybe, maybe this is the reflective point, especially as we all struggle to try to figure out how to make this all work in a new world. Um, you know, if you are coming to the hospital, let's say, for, uh, to get labs, Maybe you can call your provider and say, is there a day that I could see provider X? And, oops, uh, here we go. I'm, the, I'm sorry about that. I'm the dog barking. Um, it, it turns out the, the dogs really enjoy the Amazon delivery <laughs> person. Um, so, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry about that. But, um, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So you can coordinate or schedule your visits to think to try to minimize your exposure to the the hospital setting. You know, I think we're taking extraordinary um, uh, measures to try to keep you safe when you come to the hospital. We're redesigning waiting rooms. Um, we're minimizing the number of people who are in the clinic areas. We're providing patients with masks. But, um, you know, I think there there will still be some inherent risk with regards to um, being in in a um, in a public in a public place, as if any public place, for example, the grocery store or Costco. So, you know, I think working to be smart, to try to make these happen um, smoothly, successfully, and safely are, is important. Um, and that is all I actually have to say. Thanks so much, Dr. Crape. Again, wonderful um, insight and experience. I think that it's just really helpful to hear these different perspectives about how each center does things a little bit differently, and I think that that's good preparation for our families to know that their experiences will all be different, but, um, you know, we really are all in this together. So next up, we actually have um, Alexis Hazlitt. She is the nurse and clinic coordinator at Children's Mercy Hospital, Kansas City. Um, we've talked a lot so far about our visits with our physicians and what those look like and how to prepare um, but I think a really important component of that is your conversations, your preparation, your coordination with your nurse. And um, I, I think that that's a really big part of this is getting everything coordinated and put together and um, arranged so that things can go off without a hitch when the time comes. Um, so with that, we're going to hear from Alexis about the coordination for telehealth appointments. Alexis, take it away for us. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so some of this stuff may be a little repetitive from the other providers, um, but like Rachel said, it has more of a spin from a nursing standpoint. Um, 
So some of the things that we have done, we've been doing telehealth appointments since the middle of March, um, mid to late March here, and we are expanding that until the end of May. So we've definitely come across um, some barriers and learning curves. Um, one thing we have been able to do, and um, after talking with several other clinic coordinators, other organizations are doing the same, um, but with telehealth, we can still do a multidisciplinary approach to some extent. Um, as Dr. Cooper and Kripe said, you know, cardiology and pulmonology are a little bit more difficult with needing those in-person tests. Um, but for the most part, the rest of the team can still have some sort of an appointment via telehealth. Um, and there's a lot more that can be done with telehealth, telehealth appointments than you think. Um, our parents are great. They're a huge part of the care team. Um, you know, and so working with the parents and asking them to move their child's arms or legs, um, moving the camera so we can get a better view of the kiddos, that's been a huge part of this. Um, so I think going into these appointments, just knowing that as a parent, you have the capabilities of really helping us make the most out of this appointment. Um, kind of like what some other people have said, treat the visit like an in-person appointment. Be prepared with questions for your providers, again, to make the most out of that appointment. Um, have a clear view, um, you know, whether it's in a, you are close to a hallway where we can see your kiddo walk or um, if we need the power chair to lean back, things like that. Make sure there's some room for that. Um, and set aside on an uninterrupted time. Um, you know, life happens and and that's okay, but really trying to plan for that appointment as best as possible. Um, I know one of our families, they have five children, and so she was able to get her sister to come over um, and help entertain the other children so that we could really focus on the patient um, that we were seeing at that time. Um, communication is huge. I think we've all learned that a lot over these past few weeks, um, but be open and honest with your concerns. A lot of times a nurse or a clinic coordinator or someone will be doing some sort of intake with you before scheduling that appointment, and it's important that you talk about your concerns so that we can plan, okay, you know, they have, your child hasn't been eating very well in the last couple of weeks. That way we can plan to have the dietitian meet on that telehealth appointment. If you aren't sure, ask how long the appointment will take so that will help you um, be able to prepare to set aside a good amount of time. Uh, have equipment nearby if possible. And, um, you know, if we need to take a look at braces um, or a shower chair, things like that, if you have questions, it's actually really helpful to have those. Um, we actually were able to see a patient shower chair in their shower through a telehealth appointment, which if they would have come in to an in-person appointment, we wouldn't have had that capability. So there's lots of positives that have come out of these appointments. Um, and also know who to call if you have questions or troubles with the application, um, whether it's an administrator or your nurse coordinator. We actually um, just developed a dedicated, they call them an IT team, that can help with setup. So if you are testing your application, whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams, um, and you're not sure, make sure you have that number that you can call beforehand to try and troubleshoot some of those things. Um, also, Google is a really <laughs> helpful tool. Um, I don't know how many times I've Googled how to add this on Teams um, and things like that. So using that um, your kids probably also are really good with technology, so even if you aren't, um, some of the younger millennials may have some helpful tips for you um, that you can use as a resource as well. Some common concerns that we've heard, um, one is about insurance with uh, Dr. Kreitz talked about that a little bit, but right now most insurance um, companies are covering telehealth appointments. 
they are being billed um, similarly to an in-person appointment. Um, if you're not sure, check with your insurance plan. Um, I know there are some relaxed rules right now since it's during a state of emergency or during the pandemic, so some of that may change in the future. Um, but as it's been said, I think this, all of this will maybe change the platform in the future for how telehealth appointments can happen. And if your child's on a medication that needs assessments for prior auth, um, ask your nurse coordinator if you can get an extension for the prior authorization. A lot of state Medicaids are allowing a 60-day um, extension, so that way we can push out that authorization. So if they do require an in-person evaluation, we can push that back, um, and hopefully it'll be safer at that time for you and your child to come in. And then some assessments can be done by the PT with, um, through telehealth. Our physical therapist gave me this list of different things that she's able to do. And again, using the parents as um, resources to help with some of that stuff. And if you or your child have been to your neuromuscular team visits every six months for the last five years, you're probably pretty familiar with these assessments and what to do and what the PT is asking for. So um, that can be helpful as well. And just some more tips. Like we said, we're all learning together. Um, it's not going to be perfect on the parents' end, on our end. There's always something that's going to come up. Um, but the more you do it, the better you get, um, the more tips and tricks you learn from other people. Uh, flexibility is key. Patience is key. Uh, mark your appointment on your calendar or set a reminder on your phone. Sometimes, um, you know, lately it seems like time is just um, non-existent and we're not sure what day it is or what time of the day it is. So set that reminder on your phone for your appointment so that way you can be ready um, during that time. Again, practice the application before your appointment. Take advantage of patient portals. If you're not signed up through a patient portal or some sort of communication to your providers electronically, it's very helpful. Um, we can send our summaries of our visit through the patient portal so that you can then have documentation about everything we talked about. Um, and most importantly, if you have questions, just ask. Your nurse coordinators, um, if your center has one, they're there for you. That's what they're there for is to help answer any questions and direct you to where you need to go if they don't have the answer. Um, and that is it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Alexis. I think that was really helpful input, a little bit different perspective again to, to think about how we're approaching these multidisciplinary visits um, during this period of telehealth. So really, really great information from all of our speakers. Thank you, everyone. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and transition our format to the open Q&A. So those of you who have joined us before, you've, you've done this. Um, if you're new to the webinar format, you have a chat box function in the lower left-hand portion of your screen. Go ahead and shoot us a message. Ask your question, whether you've got burning questions or slow burn questions, anything that's on your mind um, that we can pose to the panel. Um, we are happy to answer those questions and, um, yeah, talk through whatever's on your mind. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. So one of the questions that's come up is, um, with these video visits, are those being recorded and are they available for future reference or are these um, more like FaceTime visits where you can see us, but after it's over, the video is gone? And I imagine that might be different depending on the platform. Um, but um, maybe Alexis or Orin, you could tell us a little bit about that um, question. Yeah, um, right now our telehealth appointments are not recorded. Um, we use the platform Microsoft Teams, and I know it does have that capability, but we aren't recording um, and probably wouldn't for patient privacy. Um, so really it's very similar to a FaceTime. This is Orin. Oh. We, we do not record. Uh, we use the platform video, B-I-D-Y-O, which is uh, 
what we used before uh, the pandemic, and it's HIPAA compliant, which includes not recording things. So I don't I don't know that we even have the capability of recording. Okay, cool. I think that's really helpful. I know um, HIPAA is always a concern, and privacy is always a concern. So that's really good to know. Um, another question that we got: So are these videos linked with the electric? electronic health record, or are they completely separate platforms that don't talk to each other? Um, how does that work? Oh, you know, I can, I can address that. Our, at our institution, our video platform, Zoom, connects through Epic. Um, our our uh, um, electronic uh, medical record system. So, you okay. Can, you connect through you. The family has to have a MyChart account, and that then connects um, to to a Zoom that's connected to through Epic. Um, I'm not technically savvy, but but the family just needs to log into MyChart, and then they will get a Zoom account through Epic. Um, so it's um, it's that way. But I can imagine that it's going to be different through every. Um, medical center in this country um, as to how they're going to do that. Um, so I would definitely have a dialogue and a conversation with your institution before your visit to see how you need to connect. And that, that's how it works in Colorado, too. Um, the, the added benefit of doing it that way is when you start your visit, you can actually electronically check in. You can review your list of medications, fill out questionnaires if we send them to you, and have that all ready for us before we start the visit so we can help direct your visit to your goals. That's great information. Um, I don't know, Dr. Scabina or Alexis, if you have anything to add to that? I was just going to add, um, ours is not connected through um, the medical record, so it is separate. Um, and the one advantage for that standpoint is um, a lot of families who um, have a foster child um, are not able to sign up for a patient portal for legal reasons, but they can still do the telehealth appointment since it's not directly connected to the chart. So that's one benefit of it being separate. But again, it's probably it's going to be different at every organization. Yeah, I, I mean, the way I do it, if you're um, asking the question how it works, I use my phone to actually do the video portion or the phone portion, but I have your chart opened up, and I am typing everything that we discuss, any plan, any medications. So when someone looks back, they would see that as a visit with all the information um, that was discussed at that time. Great. I think that's all really helpful insight. Again, you know, everybody's doing it a little bit differently, and I think it speaks to the importance of working with your nurse coordinator or whomever your uh, primary point of contact is at your neuromuscular center so that you know what to expect, how your specific center is doing it, since there are so many different vendors for the telehealth, um, so many different vendors, even just for the electronic health records, and what that looks like is very much going to be dependent on your specific center. So some questions about insurance and billing. Um, am I going to be billed for my telehealth visit, and does insurance pay for it? Yeah, the answer is yes, you will be billed for your telehealth visit, and um, I would contact your insurance provider prior to um, the visit to see if they are covering telehealth um, visits at the medical center that you wish to be seen at. Um, Especially this is important for patients who travel uh, out of state and may be seen in other states. Um, I, I think uh, it is truly the wild, wild west at the moment, and it is a moving target. Um, not only is it a moving target at the moment, but I've heard some rumors that things may return to pre-COVID places um, uh, um, after the pandemic is over. Um, uh, it is very difficult to know. So I, I think it's, it's, it's something that you need to explore um, to make sure that you're not going to have any financial liability at the end of the visit. 
Great. And kind of to go along with that same sort of theme, um, Alexis, I think you might have mentioned prior authorizations when you were speaking. Have you found that you've had to do many prior authorizations for these telehealth visits, or are they generally fairly well accepted, particularly since we are in the middle of a pandemic? I have not had to do any prior authorizations for the telehealth visits themselves. Um, Again, since we are in a pandemic. A lot of insurance companies are more lax on the telehealth visit itself. Um, you know, there is a difference of telehealth where the patient is at home versus a facilitated telehealth appointment where you go to um, a smaller center and do a video through that with your provider. Um, and so there may be some limitations in the future on what will be accepted as what a telehealth appointment is and can be appropriately billed by insurance. Yeah, I think it's hard to know what the future really holds. It seems like the rules that apply right now are very likely to change as we as we come out of this pandemic state and telehealth is, you know, here to stay, but our, our lives begin to get a little bit more back to normal. So it's really interesting. We'll have to follow um, follow on and see what comes of it. Um, all right, let me see. Yeah, if I could add, do we have one? Just if I could just add one quick. Um, yeah. I had a situation in which a neighboring state I had an inactive license for that state because. I don't really go there. Patient come, patients come to me in my state, even from that state. And um, when everything changed, the, that, that particular state made emergency, um, gave emergency approvals um, if you're in good standing so that we could do that. But for the first few um, patients from that state before that was granted, I couldn't actually do the telehealth, telehealth because I didn't have an active license in the state where they were different when they come to me in my hospital. Um, so I, as Linda said, that may revert and go back. So, um, But that is not something for, for you to worry about. But initially, that's why I couldn't see some patients from that state until those licenses were activated. Mm-hmm. Dr. Scavinia, you beat me to my question. That was actually part of my next question was, you know, what do you do if your patient is in a different state? I know a lot of centers, you know, Dr. Price sees patients that are not necessarily from Ohio very often um, because, you know, some of these centers are larger and pull from, you know, a really wide um, net of patients. And so maybe um, other folks can speak to um, any limitations or barriers that you've experienced because of state-to-state issues and, and how that scope of practice works with being able to talk to those patients who might not be in your state. Yeah, so uh, in Colorado, we like I said, we cover at least a seven-state region. Uh, and so we're working with each state legislature to figure out who – uh, who we can see or which providers in our practice uh, can see people. The rules for telehealth are that um, we have the physician or provider has to have a license in the state in which the patient is currently sitting at the time of the visit. So uh, if you live close to the border of the state in which your physician is sitting or is licensed, you can drive to that state um, and do a visit. <laughs> That's where we've actually done visits in parking lots. Uh, not oh. ideal. Not ideal. <laughs> but if you, you know, if you are in the parking lot of a McDonald's or a Starbucks and you can get on their Wi-Fi uh, and you're in the state where your doctor is licensed, you are allowed to do that visit. It is, as Dr. Kripe said, the Wild West. <laughs> Truly the Wild West. That's amazing. And I, you know what? That's another great tip and trick, right? So talk to your team in advance and talk through those issues, and maybe there is a creative solution. Maybe you have a, a 45-minute drive to the next state if that means that suddenly that visit becomes valid and billable. That's, that is fascinating. Oh, my goodness. I learned something new today. Um Okay, so the next question is a very practical one, um, and I'd love to hear from each of our speakers on this because you all are different subspecialties. So how long is your typical telehealth visit with a patient? Are we talking five minutes, 20 minutes, an hour? Uh, what what sort of time um, 
can the family expect when they're when they're getting ready for these telehealth visits with you? Yeah, I, I'm happy to say. I mean, I've had been looking even at my um, over the past month. There have been some situations which have really been five minutes, and probably the most have been 15 to 20. Uh, that's been my experience. But um, some that have interruptions in technology may take a little bit longer. Um, but it is it's definitely shorter than um, a one-on-one -on -one visit in in my my situation. Um, what have I what I've experienced. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, most of my visits uh, in the multidisciplinary clinic in person were, were quite busy, and so we try to keep ourselves relatively brief, but we can go over time. Um, right now, my telehealth clinic is scheduled for an hour per patient, um, but we rarely use that time in face-to-face -face interactions or screen-to-screen -screen interactions. Um, so most of my visits uh, with the younger Duchenne crowd are probably going about 15 or 20 minutes. And then as we get into more technology dependence, maybe half an hour, uh, but still not very long. Um, the, the other thing I do is if my respiratory therapist needs to adjust cough assist settings or something, I get out of the way uh, and, and let them do that. So the, all told, the pulmonary visit uh, is probably shorter than usual because we're not doing PFTs. Uh, but it still takes a good half hour or so. And Dr. Craig, how long have your visits been roughly? Um, you know, I think it depends on um, what we are seeing the patient for, but I'm going to say, I mean, uh, probably 10 to 15 minutes um, on average. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Okay. I almost think that these visits are a little longer than they are in person sometimes because you, it's, sometimes easier just to chat endlessly on a phone um, than it is if you're in person. There can be a start, a stop. You've got a little bit more eye contact, uh, a little bit more body language. So I, But, you know, the providers are going to stay on the phone with you as long as you need to have them be on the phone with you for the most part. Um, so um, in general, they're about as long as a clinic visit would be. Right. And I actually want to circle back to the comment, Orin, about the respiratory therapist. Um, I, I think, you know, when I think about my telehealth visit with my pulmonologist, um, you know, there's there's those two components. I've got my time with my physician where we're talking about my breathing and my sleep and my cough and all of these things. But the respiratory therapist plays a really important role in that interaction as well that I don't think we've really touched too much on today. So I'm wondering if maybe you could elaborate a little bit about the role of your respiratory therapist in these telehealth visits, um, whether it be looking at cough assist machines or other sort of ventilatory support devices that folks may have within the home and kind of what that looks like. Yeah, I th that's a great question. I, we've been evolving our process um, over the last six to eight weeks. Uh, and a lot of it comes from how our clinic is scheduled anyway. So in, in our multidisciplinary clinic, we have roughly everybody in the hospital visiting our patient. Um, and so the respiratory therapist and I go into the room together and we actually have mobile PFTs, so the PFTs come to us. Um, so we've kind of adapted that to telehealth where we appear in the conversation uh, together. We're not in the same room, so we have kind of a three-way video conversation. Um, but it, but it's very helpful. And for me, it's really important for the respiratory therapist to hear what's going on as well, because they have a different perspective than I might, a uh, much more technical perspective. Um, and so, so we kind of do a combo visit, and we can jump in and out, um, and we secure message each other through our medical records, say, hey, I need you in here to – to look at this thing, or can you come help over there to titrate that? So um, it becomes a three-way conversation, and it gets a little loud sometimes, but it's pretty efficient, pretty helpful. Yeah, it sounds like it's super efficient and useful. That's that's fantastic. I think that um, that's a super important component to pulmonary care. All right, so last question, and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. So if my child and I have a telehealth visit, we've done everything we can to prepare. We have our Wi-Fi ready. We've downloaded our patient portal app. We've got everything signed in. We've done our prep with our nurse. We're ready to go. And we get started and our video feed just dumps. Our internet cuts out. We're, you know, we're, we're in Colorado. Like, 
or in and our inter- and our internet is gone, you know, what do we do? So I can speak to that. It, I, it's happened to us several times. And um, you can then convert to a phone conversation. Uh, I, I, and I will speak, again, everybody's doing it a little bit differently. Um, but then what I've done is called the family, and then we have a phone visit. Um, you know, So we can at least, we may not see them. You can try to reboot, have them. I first try to have them get back in the system, see if we can try again. Um, I don't have someone from our office on with me, right? When we're doing the visit, um, but I have um, in the visits I've done as a patient and with my father, I have seen that they've had um, an administrative person with them helping so that if that happens, they can reboot or recheck uh, the family in and start it over. So that's a possibility. And then if not, you can just convert and say, let me call you uh, once I even did it as a FaceTime. I just, uh, you know. I, I called the family. They really wanted to see face to face, so I used my phone and did the face, did it via FaceTime. Great. Um, all At right, Children's Mercy. We do the same thing. Um, just calling the patient if the video um, goes out. And again, just reiterating, it's not always going to be perfect, and that's okay. Perfect. I, I think that that's a good place to end. Um, um, the fact that things are not always going to be perfect and that we're all learning and we're all doing the best that we can given these circumstances. Um, so I think we've been able to get through most of the questions, which has been really helpful, hopefully, for all of you, as it has been for me. I know I learned quite a bit. Um, this is recorded, so it will be available on our website as well as through our YouTube channel if you want to go back and listen to it again or share it with a friend or colleague, whomever. Um, so we, so that will be a living resource that we have available and we'll, we'll, um, create some written resources to accompany this webinar as well with some of these tips and tricks and lessons learned. Um, I think that'll about do it for today. So thanks so much everybody for joining us. We really appreciate you spending a portion of your afternoon with us. We hope you're all staying healthy and well. Um, and that will conclude today's recording. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.